Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we are in the season of the church, ordinary time, as it is called, where we pay special attention to Christ's teachings. Now, of course, throughout the entire church year, there's Christ's teachings, but really the first half of the, of the church year focuses on the life of Christ. Then the second half, everything turns green. And we focus more so on His teachings. Your righteousness, Jesus says, must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. That must have sounded like a thunderclap when Jesus heard it. Oh, excuse me, when Jesus' audience heard it for the first time. The scribes and the Pharisees were engaged in spiritual exercises 24-7-365. Their righteousness was evidenced by the way they wore their hair, by the clothes that they wore, the food that they ate or did not eat. They're walking down the street. Everything they said, they were paragons of virtue. Examples of righteousness galore to everyone. And now Jesus says, exceed them in order to get into heaven? Jesus calls for perfect righteousness. Utter sinlessness, complete obedience to God's law that you just heard from the Old Testament. Complete obedience to that. And not just externally, but complete obedience in thought, word, and in deed. For this is what earns a place in heaven. Now, beloved, this is something we can't do. I can't do it. We could if we were back in the Garden of Eden before the fall, but that ship has sailed. Original sin, as we just sang, has infected us, turning us into people who are now by nature turned in upon ourselves. We trust in ourselves first. We look out for our own interests first. People who easily find fault in others, that's us. And find fault in God, that's us too. But yet who imagine ourselves to be righteous, or at least yeah, righteous enough. This is why Jesus preaches the way that he does. It's so that we would hear the law. In this case, the fifth commandment. <laughs> Hearing that it does not only deal with the external act of murder, but there's this inward righteousness that's tied to it. I mean, the fifth commandment. It seems the easiest commandment to keep. We all say, I've never murdered anyone. So we can check that one off the list and we can move on to something something more pertinent, but not so fast. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to the judgment. I know Jesus was not doing this this, uh, this day, but I always imagine him like sharpening a stick. It's like the law had become really, really dull. And he's just there, not even looking up, and he's just sharpening the law. He's just sharp. And then he says, but I say to you, boom! I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the fire of hell. Oh! Oh! 
Fifth commandment doesn't just forbid murder. It instructs the heart and the lips as well. Specifically what we think and what we say about our neighbor. Those harmful words and thoughts that we use all the time, according to Jesus, are forms of murder in God's sight. Think about all those times when someone has wronged you or sinned against you. More times than not, in the slightest of ways, and you obliterate them with your thoughts and your words. Put the best construction on them, please. How about the worst deconstruction? I'll tear them down. And you do so and you're perfectly content. Insult is murder. Anger is murder. Ergo, you are a murderer. And look, if that is how you fare with what is thought to be the easiest commandment to keep, how will it be with the rest of them? I'm sitting on July 4th with a, a young man who was a friend of our family. I'd never met him before, but he's a Sikh, if you know what that is. Guys that always have the large turbans. We sat down beside the pool and started talking. He said, so what's, what's really the difference between being a Christian and being a Sikh? This is what he asked me. I'm like, how much time do you have? I knew my time was brief, and I simply said, well, we're sinners. Sinners by nature. We are sinful and unclean. He said, have you ever, you ever murdered anybody? He said, no. I said, well, Jesus says if you insult them, that's murder. You ever done that? Yeah. You ever stolen anything? That's another commandment. You ever stolen anything? Yeah, I've done that. What's that make you? A thief? Yeah. Yeah. You ever committed adultery? I said no. I said, well, Jesus says if you've looked unto a woman to lust unto her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You ever done that? It's like, um, uh, I think I gotta go here. Uh, I gotta go to another party. Like, yeah, you have already confessed to me in just these few moments that you are a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart and a murderer. This is what the law does. It sticks in you and you cannot free yourself. Jesus, isn't, his interpretation of the law makes it far more penetrating, far more dreadful than it had become. And then when it's held in front of our eyes like a, like a mirror, like we teach those in catechesis, when it's held before us, we're convicted. And we confess, I have not kept the law. I have sinned. Who can live like this? And we despair because there's no way that we can achieve this righteousness in which Jesus calls for. So what is Jesus' point? You and I need the righteousness of another, capital A, of another. One who works a righteousness outside of you, entirely outside of you. But he does it pro nobis. He does it for you. And of course, there's only one person in the history of the world who can stand before the judgment of the law and not be condemned. So for you who desperately need righteousness, what Jesus says is, look to me. I have all that you need, for his is the only righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, whom he later calls whitewashed tombs, and his righteousness is what you have. Praise be to God. 
as we've already sung, through your baptism, you first put on Christ as a garment of righteousness through faith, but it does not end there. Jesus pours his righteousness out to you through the lips of the faithful pastor who absolves you and preaches the cross to you into your ears. Jesus then pours out his righteousness for you, the very cup of salvation. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. He pours it into your mouth. The cup of salvation given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. And when you die, we will carry, or rather we will take your casket, we will cover it with a white pall to show that everyone who comes to your funeral that you were clothed in the righteousness of Christ. No doubt entering into the kingdom of heaven. And so now, made righteous in God's sight, the Holy Spirit, as we just sang as well, has made you into something new, a new creation. Thus, when we return to the commandments, we do not see them now as a mirror, but now we see them as a guide. Not to learn how to enter the kingdom of heaven, but to learn how children of heaven think and speak and act towards our neighbor. And when it comes to those who wrong us, what do we do? We love. We do not hate. We bless. We do not curse. We pray. Hear this. We pray and we do not gossip. Gossip is speaking negatively about somebody else when they are not present. And I'm telling you, and you've, you've been in the church long enough, you know this, gossip will destroy a church. We do not speak negatively of someone else without them present. Instead, we pray for them. And this is a righteousness. This is the fruit that comes from faith. Is this tough to do? It sure is. We pray for the Lord's help to soften our conscience. We pray for the Holy Spirit to dwell with us and teach us what it means to be gentle and kind and caring, asking the Lord all the way for wisdom. Beloved, this is not complete in this life, and sometimes, sometimes it gets real messy. But it is genuine. And we keep working together with the help of the Holy Spirit, striving to be righteous like Christ calls us to be. So may the Lord help us all in this endeavor. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise for prayer.